Welcome, friends. I'd like to thank John Lee Hooker and Carlos Santana, as I always do, for telling us that change is coming. This being a radio program, we have that as a music that opens the program. This is Economic Update, a program brought to you every week by the Pacifica Network. Our purpose is to analyze major economic events and trends, the forces that shape our jobs, incomes, taxes, debts, literally everything we buy and sell as we go about the economic dimension of our lives. I'm your host, Richard Wolf. I've been a professor of economics all my life at several universities. Currently, I teach in the graduate program for international affairs of the New School University <coughs> excuse me, in New York City. I also write columns for truthout.org, a courageous daily source of information and analysis. Lastly, please send me your comments, your questions, because they help shape this program. Please send them to democracyatwork.info. We read them all, and it's a way for you to help us design a program that in the end is meant to serve you. Let me begin with our short updates that we begin every program with. Today, of course, I'm going to be dealing with this item in the news every day, the sequester. And what is it? It's this theater in Washington, and theater is the careful chosen word, in which Republicans and Democrats pretend they're having a big, terrible fight about what to do with our economy. They're not. Both Republicans and Democrats agree on what is to be done. First, they want to raise taxes on most Americans. Not only do they agree on that, they've already done that. On January 1st of this year, 2013, the payroll tax went from 4.2% to 6.2%. That's a lot of increase, and it affects the 150 million Americans, roughly, who get a weekly check and who will see more money withheld from that check than they did last year. That tax affects everybody. It's not a tax, particularly on the rich. They actually don't have to pay most of it. The mass of people had the big tax increase. You heard a lot about an increase of taxes on the rich, but here's what there was on January 1st. For people who earn over $450,000 a year, that's a tiny percentage of the American people. Their income tax rack bracket, I almost said racket, went from 35% to 39.6%. If that doesn't sound like much, you're right, it isn't. It was a very small, insignificant increase on the rich, which got all the attention. Meanwhile, the very significant increase of taxes for everybody went by, and we were not to supposed to discuss how the Republicans and Democrats both agreed on that. Well, that was the tax side. Now, the sequester that everyone's talking about is the other side, cutting back government spending. Both Republicans and Democrats agree on cutting back government spending. They only bicker about what kind of spending to be cut, who's going to be cut, how much. Now, let's look at what's about to happen. Whatever the final deal between Republicans and Democrats, between Obama and the Congress, turns out to be, we're going to cut spending just like earlier this year we raised taxes. Both of those things have the same effect. They hurt the economy. When you raise taxes on people, they have less to spend. And if they spend less, they buy fewer goods and services. That means fewer people have jobs producing those goods and services. Unemployment goes up. Number two, if the government cuts back spending, here's what it means. The largest buyer of goods and services in the United States is the federal government. If it cuts back, that's fewer goods and services sold. That means there's no point in producing as many goods and services as before because the government isn't buying them, and that means more layoffs since we don't need to have the stuff produced. Okay, raising taxes, cutting spending, worsens the economic crisis we're in. Why would you do it? Well, the people at the top, those who own government debt, 
bonds that the government uses to pay for goods when it doesn't raise taxes in the past. People who own those bonds, they want the government to be sure to pay them back, to pay them interest. They want higher taxes so the government has the money to pay them. They want the government to cut spending on all kinds of social programs and use the money instead to pay off the bondholders. So the people who are bondholders, the institutions that are bondholders, they like this. And who are they? The banks, insurance companies, large corporations, wealthy individuals, and foreign governments who own the bulk of the debt of the United States. They're the bondholders. They're going to be happy. The rest of us are going to deal with an economic crisis worse than it's already been. Final point. Here's what Republicans and Democrats should have been debating when they weren't. Instead of the details of how to hurt the mass of people with increases of the payroll tax and cutting of government spending, what they could have and should have been doing is the following. Number one, they should have said, if the private sector of the United States cannot and will not hire the tens of millions of Americans who need and want to work, then the government ought to do it. They should have had a debate about that, the pros and cons. They didn't. But they should have, and that would have helped more people and done something for the economy way more significant than all of this bickering about what is, in effect, the American austerity program of raising taxes and cutting spending. The second thing they should have debated is, here we have our banks and corporations flush with cash, mm -hmm. estimated at 3 to $4 trillion that they're not investing. They're not using it to hire people. They're not using it to produce wealth in this country. Okay, that ought to have a debate begin. Why do we permit this? If the society as a whole, if the majority need that money to be invested to provide jobs and to provide output to solve our problems, poverty, rebuilding our cities, all of it, then we shouldn't be allowing private owners of this wealth to make the decisions that are good for them but are no good for the rest of us. We are the majority. That should be debated. Finally, if corporations across America are making decisions that are good for them, and those decisions are not working out for the economy as a whole, that ought to be faced. Why are we allowing the decisions over our resources, the wealth, the goods, the machines that we as a people have produced, to be used in a way that isn't good for the majority, that produces economic crisis, it produces a generation of students with debts they can never repay, etc. Why are we permitting this? That's, those are the big issues. That's what our elected representatives should be talking about. They have not a word to say about it. They all agree to leave it as it is, and they bicker over how big the tax increases on us will be and how horrible the spending cuts of the government will be. That's not a political system that represents the needs of the people. That's a political system that represents those who run the economy. Let me turn next in our economic updates, our short ones, before I introduce my guest and we have the interview for the bulk of today's program. I want to turn to the automobile industry here in the United States. It's getting a lot of attention these days. It's having a lot of impact, as it always has. It's been a major industry in this country for the last half century. Where is it? Well, we have some statistics that just came out, and I want to bring them to your attention. The first one comes from the United States Energy Information Administration, EIA, and you can go to their website and find out more. They just announced something interesting, that we have the highest expenditure of American family incomes for gasoline that we have had in 30 years. That's right. More than at any time in the last 30 years, Americans are spending 4% of their pre-tax income on the average. Wow. 4%. That's a lot. If you take away the taxes, it's a much higher percentage, of course. It would be more like 6 or 7%. A major chunk of our income used to pay for gasoline. And here's some interesting things about it. We use less gasoline than we used to, but the gas companies have jacked up the price, so they still get the money out of us, even though we have cut back on the amount of energy that we use in our automobiles. How interesting. How interesting 
that they're still raking in the same amount of money, but we're just driving smaller cars, more energy inefficient cars, and we're driving less. Interesting. Something to think about. But the automobile industry is also in the headlines in another way. We still use way more gasoline than we need to. That requires us to be dependent on foreign countries from whom the oil comes. It requires us to expend money outside the country that would be better used, spent here. It absorbs too much of people's income so they can't buy the goods and services that might give other people jobs. There are a lot of problems. And here's a solution that has been proposed and is gaining traction in Washington and among our political leaders to jack up the gasoline tax. That's right, to increase the tax so your price at the pump will go even higher than it already is as it takes a record portion of our income. I don't think that's the way to go and I want to make sure it's in your minds. That's part of what Economic Update as a program designs to do. So here's a thing to think about. Before getting into a debate about jacking up the price of gas, which of course hits worse those with the least amount of money in their pocket for whom an increase is the most painful. A wealthy person could care less if you jack up 10, 15 percent per gallon. But for those of us on budgets, for those of us in the middle of what's left of the middle class, it's a big item. So here's an alternative solution. Public transportation. It's a disaster in this country that we don't have that debate. The automobile is the largest consumer of energy in our society. The automobile is the largest hurter of people. Injuries and death from car accidents is the major cause of injury and death in the United States every year, much more destructive than our wars. And finally, the automobile is the single largest polluter of air in our society. If we move from a private individual auto-based system to a system that really provided mass quality, convenient public transportation. We would vastly reduce the injury and death. We would vastly reduce the uh, pollution, and we would have a much more efficient transportation system. Much less gallons of fuel per mile of a person moved if you do it in public transportation. Trains, buses, trolleys, we know how to do it. We should be having that debate. We aren't, but we ought to be. Last thing about the automobile industry. Over the last two or three weeks, Ford, General Motors, Chrysler, Toyota, the big companies have announced they're increasing hiring people. Isn't it wonderful, the recovery of the automobile industry? And if you put it all together, they've announced over the last two or three weeks, maybe 20, maybe even 25,000 increased hiring. I'd be the first one to applaud increased hiring. But there are two things to keep in mind so we have a proper perspective on all of this. The first one, much of the new hiring, the bulk of it, is under what's called a two-tier system that was negotiated between the automobile companies and the unions. Here's what that means. New hires do not have to be paid the roughly $26 to $28 an hour that's the base pay for skilled automobile workers that has been fought for and won over decades of struggle by labor unions. Instead, with an agreement of the labor unions, they can hire new workers at roughly $16 an hour instead of $26 to $28, which means, yes, they're hiring people, and yes, that's good. But the impact on the communities where those workers live is half of what it used to be. It isn't going to mean good community situation. Those workers are going to barely get by. They're not going to be able to pay the taxes they once did. They're not going to be able, therefore, to enable their communities to buy the education and the fire service and everything else. We're redeveloping a job situation for these people, but at a much lower standard of living. Second thing to keep in mind, let's, let's not fool ourselves. As recently as 1996, the number of Americans working in the automobile sector was 1.1 million. In 2013, including the ones being hired, it's 650,000, barely over half. We have decimated our auto system. We have replaced jobs with machines. 
and we haven't taken care of those other people, which is why places like Detroit suffer the problems that they have. Final update before we turn to our interview has to do with something sad, but something worth thinking about. This has to do with the country of South Africa. South Africa is in the news two ways in recent year, uh, weeks. The first has to do with a series of outrages committed by their police department, uh, a police department that has grown since independence from 120,000 to 200,000 people, an unspeakable increase in the police presence of that society. And closely associated with it is a problem of rampant poverty, rampant crime, and rampant conflict in the industries of South Africa. Most recently, the fruit and wine sector. South Africa is a major producer of fruit and of wine. That employs 500,000 workers in that country whose average daily minimum wage, which is what most of them earn, is $7. Let me do that again. $7 a day. And they've been striking to raise their income because they, they can't live on it. They would like to get, that's their ask, $14 a day. Try to imagine living on that. And they have suffered savage repression by the employers and by the police. Why do I bring this up? Well, I would like you to think about the next time you consider buying fruit and wine from South Africa, what kind of conditions it comes from, and think about it. But there's a bigger issue. South Africa, with its remarkable leader, Nelson Mandela, is a modern story of heroism and of a country under the thumb of a minority in an apartheid situation that finally got its independence, its political independence, it's a republic, it's its own country. But what that teaches us with the conditions they're now in, political in independence is at best half the battle. You've got to change your economic system, or otherwise you will leave behind the oppressor you had and have a homegrown oppressor instead. Have your own society oppressing your people because they're not given the economic opportunities they ought to have had, and that ought to have been part of their independence struggle from the beginning. That's a lesson of South Africa. Let me turn now and welcome my guest. She is Dr. Harriet Fraud, a person with whom I collaborate from time to time, as many of you know. She is a psycho therapist, a hypnotherapist who works in New York City. Uh, she's the author, most recently, of a book, together with myself and Stephen Resnick, called Class Struggle on the Home Front. Uh, she writes and publishes in the uh, news service Truth Out, that I mentioned at the beginning of the program, but also in Tikkun Magazine and website, uh, International Cycle History Journal, and several other places. You can find her work also at harrietfraud.com, and I will explain, uh, spell it for you, H-A-R-R-I-E-T-F-R-A-A-D.com, uh, where you can see her work, including eventually this program. So Dr. Fraud, Harriet, welcome to the program. Thank you. Glad to be here. Uh, you've been on a program before. Uh, it got a lot of interest. My listeners and viewers wanted to have you back, so I'm glad you had the time to join us. Me too. Okay, today's discussion is going to focus on a topic called family values and the economy. Uh, we live here in the United States where a great deal of attention is paid to family values. Uh, not just our conservative uh, fellow citizens, but almost everybody feels the need to say often that we're committed to family values, that the family is an important institution, perhaps even the most important institution in our society, and that we are committed as a nation to support and encourage families and family values. Okay, that's what I want to talk about, but I want to start the conversation by raising two questions about the so-called commitment to family values. The first has to do with something called 
paid family leave. The 31 other most developed economic countries in Europe, in Asia, and so forth, um, provide paid annual family leave for at least a year, and in some cases, more than a year. In other words, one or sometimes more than one parent can take a leave to care for a new infant uh, for a year and be paid so that it is not an imposition on the family. The United States is among the few nations, really it's a small handful, that does not provide anything like that. There is no legal requirement for pay, uh, paid family leave. Most Americans do not have any paid family leave, and even the small number of Americans who have some paid family leave do not have more than a few weeks, and they are a tiny minority of the workforce. So the first question I have for you, uh, and I have two that I'm going to start with, has to do with how do you square this bizarre refusal to provide the support that other countries do for families, particularly couples that are having a child, with this commitment, so-called, to family values. And the other question, which is the same idea, is we have one of the lowest minimum wages in the developed world. We pay people $7.25 an hour as the federal minimum wage. It is 50% or more higher in most European countries, just to give you an idea. Uh, even some states in the United States find it so abhorrent, like Washington and Oregon, that they too make it 9 and $10 an hour because, among other reasons, how can you raise a family if you're earning $7.25 an hour? You can't provide your children with even the minimum. Of, uh, so how do you explain or understand that we are committed to family values, sort of, but in our economic policy, we don't seem to carry through on that commitment? Well, <clears throat> we're committed a lot more to capitalist profit than we are to family values. And what am I talking about here? What I'm talking about is that ever since the 1970s, wages have remained flat. And in the 70s, white males, this was never available for minorities, but white or for white women or minority women, got a family wage on which they could support a family. Since wages have tapered off and been flat continuously since then, maybe a little blip here and there, and since just in the last year, the 99% uh, have gone down 0.4% on average, while the top have gone up 1%, incomes have gone up 11%, we're looking at the question, OK, put our money where our mouth is. Where is our money going? And if we look at the priorities nationally, where is our money going? Well, about a trillion dollars, actually 770, excuse me, 711 billion is going towards our military which has more military hardware and resources, as our families have the least, but it has the most, among all the other highly militarized nations combined. Yes, it's well known around the world. The United States spends more on military uh, activities than the next 20 countries combined. And as our wages have gone down, and as our children's health has gone down, and as our infant mortality has gone up, and as our families have gone down to the point that one out of four U.S. children is on food stamps and living at or one half of American children are either living at or just above the poverty level. Whereas the military has grown 81%. The funding for the military and the military Spending has gone up 81% since 2011. Quite dramatic. And we have closely related, in terms of family values, another profitable sector, which is gun sales. The Washington Post glibly declared the U.S. gun industry has been one of the brightest spots 
in the U.S. economy in recent years, even through the recent downturn. This year, which was 2012, it racked up $11.7 billion in sales. So we're talking about putting our money where our mouth is, which is to the producers of military weapons that make us the hegemonic or the overwhelming military power of the world and also ranks us among the last in terms of the UN uh, Register of Child Well-Being. We, have, we are second to the bottom of the developed countries in everything except healthcare where we are the bottom. Well, let me, let me provoke you a little bit. Let's assume that the folks who say we are a society committed to the family and family values are sincere, just for the moment. Uh, then how do you explain that they nonetheless don't have family leave, pay an absurd low minimum wage, focus so many of their resources on the military, support a gun industry, all things that by most stretches of the imagination are not consistent or at least not very, <coughs> excuse me, with, with family values. What's the problem? What is it that is intruding on the way we handle our economic life that sacrifices, in a sense, our family? Well, in our society, the elephant in the room of all of these discussions is the elephant of capitalism, which basically has been responsible for outsourcing decent jobs uh, and outsourcing services and changing wages to lower them or keep them flat in order to create profit. And we also have had weak unions that have not defended us against outsourcing. They've been very much company unions in that they wanted a bigger share. They didn't want to take over like the European unions do. They're socialist unions or sometimes communist unions. And so um, we have had a set of priorities that declares family values, but actually neglects family values. In terms of maternity leaves, which are granted in almost paid maternity level leave is part of almost every country in the world. The only people with no paid maternity leave are the United States, Somalia, Papua, and Papua New Guinea. And Liberia, and I noticed. Liberia. Right. Now, so we're right up there with Papua New Guinea, Somalia, which is in constant chaos, and Liberia. What are we talking about? And that's because we are a country in which the capitalist elephant takes up the whole room and the family is basically somewhere pressed against the side of the room with no space. And the same groups that quite powerfully appreciate mothering and family labor do nothing to support it. Because as now, half of the workforce, approximately 45% of the workforce is female, they fight childcare. Reagan was the first one to veto day, um, Head Start for everyone. And these are the people who veto and kill Head Start, family leave, maternity pay, paternity pay, elder care, teen pregnancy help, addiction help. They, they veto everything that would help the family. Aid to single mothers. You know, 42%, as the family has, the reason that we have this is the family has collapsed in the United States. The majority of women in the United States for the first time since they began counting in 1880 is single. And they're not single for any reason except that the basic deal of being protected and supported while you raise children is over. Men can't support women anymore because the capitalist colossus has decided it's more profitable to outsource their job or mechanize their jobs. And particularly male jobs have been hit because the hardest hit sectors have been heavy machinery, manufacturer, high ticket sales. And these are areas in which and construction, where males were dominant. It's interesting to me as an economist 
that when there is even a little bit debate about all these kinds of issues that you've brought up, the argument not to help uh, fund paid leave for people, not to raise the minimum wage, is always put in terms of what it will do to business. We don't hear about what it will do to families. Exactly. So the same forces that push all these things that are supposed to help business wait until another occasion when there isn't an economic question on the table to talk in great poetic terms about the family. But it's a disconnect is what you're saying. It's a total disconnect yeah. because also at the same time, and, and it should be understood by our listeners, that I am not advocating women's financial dependency on men, which I think destroyed many relationships because women stayed for financial reasons, men bitterly stayed for their reasons of guilt and the dependency of women and children on them. It made resigned and bitter relationships often and polarized men and women against each other. And also it wasn't good for children to It was terrible up in that to grow up with that kind of conflict. And it also totally dislodges the deep and respectful and collective relationships you can have among equals. One of the troubles in our whole society that makes the intimate re arena a disaster is that the ideal of democracy at home, of democracy among parents and children, of giving each according to their ability and taking from each according to their needs, giving according to their needs, respecting their different needs, and having a collective approach is very rare in our society, partly because the airwaves are owned by those same capitalist people. And so you can have a media with all sorts of guns and product placement, but very little placement for a primacy of egalitarian collective relationships, both in our economy and in our families and between parents and children. So you have this capitalist colossus over everything which is the dictator of our society. And that means that families are out of luck, particularly children. We're going to take a short break, as we do in the middle of the program. I'm interviewing Dr. Harriet Fraud, psychotherapist. I'm Richard Wolff, and the focus, when we return, will be on the economy and the family, a complicated and tense relationship, perhaps more than ever. We should be about halfway through. We're back. We're continuing our interview with Dr. Harriet Fraud. And I wanted to um, pick up on one of the last points you made. Is it your view as a person who deals in your practice as well as in your research with what's happening to families and family relationships, would you say that the family is an institution that is under assault in our society, that is an institution Definitely. being undercut? And, and, and how do you see that, and, and, and what do you see as the reasons for it? Well, I see it being systematically undercut. And the way it's undercut is that women are required in the labor force because pe families can't make a living, and also because now 42% of people give birth outside of a marriage or traditional family unit, and about 75% of the children in the United States grow up without both biological parents present at some point or another, and we do nothing to help single parents. So for example, in the United States, mothers get paid 70% of what men are paid, whether they're fathers or not, where, uh, because there isn't significant help given to parents. In Sweden, where single parents are given primacy of housing and jobs, you have night women earning 98% of what men earn. And in the United States... Well, uh, just a footnote for our listeners and viewers. So in other words, Sweden gives a privilege, it gives a, a favor to single parents because since they have a harder time sustaining and building a family, they get the support. It's a logical That's argument, right. but we don't have a comparable thing here. Right. Subsidized housing 
And also all of these countries, whether it's France or Sweden, have free after-school programs and summer programs and childcare and all of those things which we don't have. But that what you have is you have then the whole terrain of the family and intimate relationships has changed. And what because men can no longer support women and women have to work outside the home and there's no help for families and so that men who often feel under siege as men because of this change because situation. of this change situation want extra services from women who are working a third shift by working at home and working with children and working on the job and trying to be sexy they're not going to do it that's why the majority of women is unmarried and the majority of people who initiate divorces now are women and who refuse marriage are women so you have if the center of family was marriage that's over that's basically over because the economic conditions of existence for that are support in for children in terms of child care and after school care and summer care it which means a woman who has a full-time job could not possibly do no and so here's an example of family value to get a the average cost of child care that's decent i'm not talking about high quality is the same as a community college's tuition the average cost of quality daycare is a between thirty and forty thousand dollars a year, which is the median income is about forty five thousand dollars a year, so that would take up your whole income. So you have millions of children in substandard daycare parked in their soiled diapers in front of televisions during the maximal years of brain development, zero to two years old. And you have very few federal programs for that era. And so that therefore you totally abandon family values in order to create greater profit. And you do that as no other developed nation in the West does. But this is not even an argument that we're not supporting families. This we're is a, an argument them. that we're destroying families. We are families destroying by families. The, by a mixture of abuse and neglect uh, of the kinds of things that other societies are doing in the name of family values that they feel they have to carry through on. We seem to have here 90% rhetoric and very little reality. Very little reality. And so that, whereas, you know, I'll take just one example. Women who are not married and don't have children earn more than men do. Women who are married but have no children make 98% U.S. women. Mothers make 70% of what? males earn you know it's right it's literally there built a, into our a penalty system. Yes, for right. being a parent and having a penalty for being in a relationship and getting married a penalty for having children which is why the biggest increase in types of housing is single person housing and the second is couples with no children for the first time the birth rate is going well down down because people are smart enough to see it for a long time it was sustained by immigrants who came here not realizing how costly and unrewarded it is to have children except for the emotional rewards you can garner in your exhausted time with your children but that now they're not bothering to come as many mexicans are going home as are coming because there's no point and so now the birth rate is actually going down because it's you know, there are no paid maternity and paternity leaves as there are in the other developed countries. So that you're actually hurting families. Another dramatic example is by having one out of three African men in the penal system, you're taking people away from their children. In a, we have the biggest incarceration rate of any developed country, and there's no help for children in this situation or to integrate children and families together when that happens. And so we, we really are a very backward country as we give everything to capitalist efficiency. We're also the only ones without proportional representation. 
So, and with private money allowed in elections, which is not allowed in the other developed countries. And so you get one person, one vote, no more. One person buys other people's votes. Yes. I mean, even a country like France, which also has social problems, which also has great diversity, which begins its children with poverty, but the children end up much less poor. They begin with 25% of their children being born into poverty. But when you factor in all the social benefits, 9%. Still too much. However, their um, early child care is by experts. It's free from three years old on. Their after-school programs are heavily subsidized. You can never spend more than 15% of your income between zero and three which is when the programs become free, on daycare. We're talking about another world for families. And the reason that the French do that is that they want to encourage population and families. The United States has counted on poor immigrants coming here and being exploited and has a terrible family program. And often their decimation of families is couched in family values. So Reagan, who, among others, who was instrumental in decimating wages, was also the first to deny Head Start for everyone on the basis that it interfered with the family, just as the opponents of public education said it interfered with the power of the family. So you take re economic resources away from the family in the name of respecting the family. Exactly. And undercut the family in the name of supporting family. That's right. It is a an example that would make... Uh, the concept of self-delusion take on a whole new meaning. Uh, let me turn a little bit and ask you for the other side. In a sense, I don't want everyone to get down about this reality. It's very important that we talk about it. It's very important that you bring these uh, facts and this interpretation uh, to our audience. But let me ask you, what would, lo what would it look like in your mind if we had a program or a commitment that was real. In other words, if we seriously wanted our economic system to work to support and sustain family as an institution, give us some idea of, of, of what that might look like. It would start out with universal quality health care. We have the worst health care in the developed world, and we pay the most for it. And that would, of course, include maternity care and so on. That which exist in most the all the other advanced countries. Yeah, all the countries. others uh, have that. Read, uh, viewers and listeners should always remember uh, basic health care for everyone, whether or not you're employed, whether or not your parents are in a job that carries health insurance, you get that as a, as a right of citizenship. Exactly. And, and that's a commitment all these countries make, and we are really among the very, very few that don't the do that. The three most backwards. Anyway... You'd also have maternity and paternity leaves. In some countries like France, you can get half pay up to five years of the maternity leave. In countries like Norway, they have compulsory paternity leave as well as maternity leave, so you can't get extra credits at work for abandoning your kids when they're born In other words, and the not father bonding with as them. As well as the mother has to has stay to home. Exactly. Interesting. And uh, you would have a good system of child care like the French system where they have little houses for children of one type, zero to three, and the other from three to seven before they go into the public schools. And they're maintained by, there's a medical personnel at all times, so if a child is sick, they can go in to be taken care of. They have a pediatric nurse in every facility in case somebody gets sick. They have their shots there. And they're fed the, in daycare. They're, they're fed three meals there. You can have your child there if you want to from 7 in the morning to 7 at night, picked up clean, bathed, and in a clean outfit because they give you an outfit when you get there. It's a very different. All right. So universal medical care, a serious quality child care program. And maternity and paternity leave. Maternity leaves. and paternity leave. What else would you advocate? I would advocate educational parks for children from 6 to 12, big facilities that are, of course, integrated with the highest quality educational facilities for everyone, and education parks for children who are 
three to six as well. So maybe so the other. By a so park, that you'd you have mean bringing all different all kinds of, of people together. All of them together with every, it would save a lot of money because you wouldn't have duplication. People can be bused in and they can have the most advanced science and. So the, it's the old argument again, not to allow private spreading resources. out of schools to different neighborhoods, rich and poor, not to allow private versus public schools, exactly. but to bring the community together so everyone has an interest in the best possible school for everyone. A high quality school, and you wouldn't, you know, people could send their kids so to private school if they wanted to, but they wouldn't because this would be the best quality. It would be the kind of quality that Obama's children have at the Sid Friends School that cost $43,000 a semester. And Biden's grandchildren go there, and the head of the housing um, commissioner of HUD, his Sean Donovan, his children go there. And that's, you know, that's, my God, it's a, you know, $86,000 a year if you have two kids. But that would be the quality of care for everyone. So and it's the opposite, for example, of the movement to charter schools now exactly. that, are, that are fracturing and each little charter school can provide whatever quality it does to its little community and the rest of the schools, the people who can't afford it or can't get into those, they are left. So you get this first class, second class, third class quality of education. Which you get from living in an elegant neighborhood even if you send your kid to a public school. The PTA in New York in one school raised $25,000. So that means they can hire their own art teacher and math coordinator and blah, blah, whereas other schools can't raise so much money. So you, it takes away the vast inequality of, of educational opportunity and gives all kids a good opportunity. You'd also have paid vacations, which ev you know the French have a guaranteed five weeks. Five weeks. You'd have family leave. You'd have special supports for single parents. You'd have supports for elders so that they don't become a burden or isolated in single room occupancy hotels and degenerating and creating huge Medicare problems, actually. And you'd have free education from daycare through university or training school. As Those many advanced industrial countries absolutely provide. Absolutely, as they provide. To sum up, um, all of the things you list, we know are possible Absolutely. because we know they're achieved in other societies. Societies that have no greater resources than this fewer. one does. In many cases, fewer. So it's possible. It's needed. It would, in fact, be consistent with family values. Absolutely. What's lacking is the political will and the organization to make that happen against the interests of profit-making, which argue and push against it. That's right. And what we don't have is a strong political presence that says, no, you don't, when these things are cut and they're not passed. I was in France one year when they had thought of cutting the benefits to early childhood education. They had hundreds of thousands of people in the street organized by the socialist unions, organized by the various... And by the Roman Catholic Church, too. Even the Roman Catholic Church was organized because it was an obvious parent thing, that there is... We don't have the political organization of the mass of people to press for what's good for us. And so what our legislators do, since who pays the piper calls the tunes, is call the tunes of capitalist profit at the expense of the family while touting family values. Dr. Harriet Fraud, thank you very much. I thank appreciate you. your time. And this very is a much. very important issue. Thanks. In the time that remains in our program, I'm going to do as we always do. First, talk to you about an example of workers getting together to organize their enterprise in a cooperative way, a non-capitalist way. And I try to choose examples from all the different kinds of enterprises that there are, big ones in the tens of thousands of employees, little ones in the United States and out of the United States. This week I want to mention just briefly a remarkable enterprise. It's been going now for a good five years. It's called the Firestorm Cafe and Bookstore. It's located at 48 Commerce Street in Asheville, North Carolina. They're a group of people, I believe they're eight in number, have been very successfully building their own small cooperative business. 
and let me read to you their own self-description. Firestorm Cafe and Books is run without bosses or supervisors, relying instead on a horizontal workplace. Each worker owner is responsible for both weekly shift work and a share of managerial duties. Decision-making is achieved using a formalized consensus process in which each participant has an equal voice. The cooperative environment creates a more empowering and enjoyable workplace while strengthening the business itself. We are committed to a nonprofit model and we will reinvest 100% of our earnings in the community once we are able to compensate labor at the equivalent of a livable wage. Taking care of themselves, being responsible to the community, no bosses needed, a collective cooperative enterprise. A vision of a future utopia? No. A real live coffee and bookstore in North Carolina right now in the United States. Finally, I turn to a couple of your questions. Uh, and we're getting loads of these questions. Thank you very much. We can't answer all of them. Please keep them coming, as always, to democracyatwork.info is where you send them. First question. You mentioned in a previous program that banks got federal help and then went to the Cayman Islands. So let me repeat that for those of you that might have missed it. And my source is a United States senator who gave a speech in which he put all this information out there. There are other ways of getting it. The senator in question is Bernard Sanders, U.S. Senator from the state of Vermont. And here's what his research showed. And he has a good staff. I know some of those folks. They do first-class economic research. During 2009, 10, and 11, and for all I know, continuing, the very banks getting the bulk of the bailout money from the Federal Reserve and the United States Treasury, much of that being the money you and I pay in taxes that goes to Washington to bail them out. At the same time, we were bailing them out from the disastrous investments they made, the terrible speculations they made. They were taking their money and moving it out of the United States into bank accounts at their own subsidiaries established in the Cayman Islands in the Caribbean. The Cayman Islands are an independent country. They have no income tax personal, no capital gains tax, and no corporate business tax. Zero, zero, zero. That's why they're an attractive place to do business. So the banks, and I'm going to give you the name, moved the money, including the money that we were giving them to bail them out, to a place where they wouldn't have to pay taxes to the United States government. They wouldn't have to contribute to the government the money being used to bail them out. Think about it. These included the following, according to Senator Sanders. Bank of America, Citigroup, J.P. Morgan Chase, Goldman Sachs. And just in case you thought it was only banks, no, no, other companies use the Cayman Islands for the same tax evasion purposes. And I'll mention just three. Google, Apple, and Microsoft all mentioned by Senator Sanders. Let's be clear here. This is legal in most cases. There may be some illegal aspects of it, but it's basically a legal operation. Laws have been developed to allow them to do that. In fact, they helped create and pass the laws that give them that freedom. But it's something to think about, that we have a system that not only works that way, makes all of that legal, but then we have to hear why the government has to cut back social security for old people, support for daycare, because there's not enough money. Now we know why there's not enough money. Because the banks we bailed out and the corporations we make profitable escape their fair share of taxes by using that kind of an act. Think about it. Regulations can be fixed and adjusted by them. We have to change the way we do business or else we are all going down with a system that doesn't work. Final thought for the day. If there had to be a public source of money to invest, would it make sense? I'm going to tease you at the end of today's program. 
All decisions about investment basically in the United States are made by private companies. They decide where to invest, whether to invest, how to invest. The result is there are jobs or there aren't. There are jobs here or there are jobs somewhere else. If we all have to live with the results of an investment decision, then there's a basic question that ought to be at the forefront of our discussions in this country. If we all have to live with the results of investment decisions, why do we allow them to be made by people whose first obligation and whose first objective is to make money for a private corporation? They're going to make decisions that are good for them, not decisions that are good for all of us. To make investment decisions for everybody, we would have to socialize the investment process, take it away from private enterprises, and make it serve the community as a whole. It's an old idea. It's coming back into vogue because the private way of making decisions has produced the worst crisis in a long, long time. Thank you again for joining me for Economic Update. Thank you, Dr. Fraud. Thank you. I look forward to talking with you and seeing you again next week.